I enjoyed that. Thank you, Sharon. Hello, everyone. This is Kimberly Gale with the Columbus Minority Business Assistance Center. Uh, just say hello. If you have time, just at the bottom of your screen in the chat screen, you want to test some things out, just go ahead and say hello that you're here. Welcome to our executive series with Miss Donna James. All right, I think we'll get started. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Kimberly Gale. I am the Regional Director for the Minority Business Assistance Center. So welcome to our executive series. Uh, we are so excited today to talk to um, Mrs. Donna James, and um, I'm going to read her bio in a minute. Um, before we get started, though, just want to let you know if you have not registered any services with um, the Minority Business Assistance Center. What we provide is technical assistance, um, free business counseling services, uh, certification assistance, training and development um, is what you're seeing right now as part of what we do. Um, if you're interested in joining MBAC services um, to obtain some of those free services, um, be, feel free to email us at mbac at cul.org. I have on here my team, Ms. Sharon, uh, who's our program administrator, Ms. Janine Hooks, who is our business advisor. And so uh, we just want to let you know that we're here available for you to uh, start, scale, and grow your business if you need assistance to do so. Um, so welcome. Um, in light of what we're doing with our executive series is that we are uh, doing this probably once a month so that we can identify um, wonderful executives in the field of entrepreneurship um, who have really been in the trenches for a long time that can give us, number one, some inspiration right now. <laughs> Let's just say that, some hope, um, some yeah. advice, um, considering what is going on with the crisis uh, of COVID-19 and now what's happening across the country, the unrest of racial tension that's happening right now across the country. So um, before I get started, are there any questions? Um, in terms of what we'll discuss today, we'll go ahead and interview Donna James. If you have any questions for Donna, feel free to put it in the chat box. Um, and then we'll, we'll answer those questions throughout the interview or at the end and go from there. If you're just logging on, hello. Hi, Keisha, good afternoon. Anybody else, please say hello. Uh, what I before I kick it off though, I love to ask one question, and that is, how are you feeling today? And describe it in one word. How are you feeling today? And put it in the chat box, and um, describe it in one word. Marvelous. That's great. Hopeful. That's mine. <laughs> Encouraged. Thank you. I feel redefined. Hi, Jesse. Encouraged. Hi, Gloria. Motivated. Great. Busy. Cheryl, that's a, that's a good one. <laughs> I was tired last week. I don't know what happened over the weekend. Maybe I got a couple of hours of sleep. <laughs> she, uh, hi, blessed, busy, hopeful, motivated. Encourage, redefine. Thank you all. Thank you all. Anybody else? One word. Describe how you're feeling today. Okay. Well, I'm going to introduce, uh, and I'm just so honored to do this today. So, um, you know, Donna has been an inspiration to me, and I'm just so honored to even. I just want to thank you, Donna, for even giving us the opportunity to speak with us today. I know you are very busy, and so we just appreciate and, um, that you're taking the time to do that. For those of you who don't know Donna, um, she's just a trusted resource and advisor to leaders in the public and private sector, ranging from entrepreneurs to C-suite executives of Fortune 500 companies. She is the managing director of Larden and Associates, LLC. Her expertise includes corporate governance, business strategy and development, human capital management, financial and risk management, and leadership development. 
Um, she serves on the board of directors for public companies, Boston Scientific and L Brands, as board advisor for Marathon Petroleum and board member of the private company, Exponents. Did I pronounce that correctly? Right. Um, yep. Okay. She is part board member of the Marathon, um, past board member of the Marathon Petroleum Corporation, Time Warner Cable, Coca-Cola Enterprises Incorporated, and Intimate Brands and CNO Financial Group. Prior to starting her business, Ms. James retired after 25 years as president of Nationwide Strategic Investments, a division of Nationwide Mutual Insurance Company. She's a former education experience as an accounting professional with PricewaterhouseCoopers, which I worked for when I first moved to Columbus, and provided the foundation for her effectiveness in both business and community endeavors. In her community, Ms. James is the co-founder and former board chair of the Center for Healthy Families, a nonprofit focused on transforming the lives of pregnant and parenting teens and their children. She is also a member of the Governor Mike DeWine's Minority Health Strike Force, board trustee for Ohio Health, and co-executive director for the African American Leadership Academy, where I am a part of, and I'm so honored to be um, serving as an advisor there. Some of her past community roles included an appointment by President Obama as chair of the National Women's Business Council, co-chair for the Columbus Celebrate One Initiative to Reduce Infant Mortality, board trustee for North Carolina Agriculture and Technical State um, University, co-chair of the Women's Fund of Central Ohio, trustee for the Health Policy Institute of Ohio, the United Way of American Board of Governors, Bennett College for Women Board of Trustees, Central State University Board of Trustees, I Know I Can, Wexner Center of the Arts Board of Trustees, NC uh, A&T State University School of Business Advisory Board and Chairwoman of the YMCA of Columbus. And it doesn't stop there, you guys. Ms. James has received several recognition, Columbus Hall of Fame, Who's Who in Black Columbus Lifetime Achievement Award, King's Arts Complex Legends Award, Columbus Metropolitan Li Library Celebration of Learning Award, Columbus Museum of Art Honoree, Center for Healthy Families Honoree, Red Cross Humanitarian of the Year, Ohio River Valley Women's Business Council Trailblazer Award, the National Historically Black Colleges and Universities Hall of Fame, named by Black Enterprise Magazines as one of the top 75 in corporate America. We see the National Beta Gamma Sigma Business Achievement Award and the YMCA Women of Achievement Award. She is the recipient of three honorary doctorates. Now, this is what I didn't know, Donna. Uh, from Otterbein University, Tiffin University, and her alma mater, um, North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. North Carolina a &T. Woo! How does that feel to hear all the things that you accomplished? Tired. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it was exciting for me to see how involved you are in the community. And, and that's why I chose you in our executive series because you know, it's one thing to be in the corporate landscape and to be an entrepreneur. It's another thing to be so drenched and serving as a leader uh, and being so involved in the community. So we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for your service. We really, really do. So I'll just start off by saying, if you could give me a perspective before COVID-19, what was your insights of how things were going from a holistic point of view economically, especially for some of the companies that you, you yeah. sit on? How was business before this all happened? No, it's a great question and, and uh, uh, thank you. Um, it's rare that I get to read my, uh, have my entire bio um, shared with a group um, so I'll remind everyone, you can do anything, you just can't do it all at once. And so fortunately, all of those things aren't going on now. They uh, have occurred, you know, over a 40-year uh, career, so to speak. Um, 
I really like your question about kind of the perspective pre-COVID and what was going on. Um, in my work, uh, and then just personally, um, I try to keep my eye on what's going on uh, at a macro level um, in the economy, as well as at a micro level relative to my business and my personal finances uh, and that of my families. And one thing I became aware of many, many years ago is that the economy runs in cycles. Right. It, you know, and we had been on a cycle since 2008, 9, 10, downturn, um, and um, the recession we experienced then. 10 years ago. And 10 years out, the question became, how long is this uptick going to last? I mean, right. it has been a great ride. And the question, you know, becomes getting the unemployment down to where it was, getting, um, you know, so many businesses running and running well, or even if they were struggling, at least seeing where they um, could get to the kind of light at the end of the tunnel. The question in my mind always was, what's going to happen that's going to change this cycle? Um, because it never lasts forever. And you always have to think about what do I need to be prepared for in case of a downturn. But it's hard to predict what's going to drive the downturn. Last right. time it was the banking system. And there right. was little to no liquidity. So you could not get to money. Um, this time around, it's COVID. And it's not the banking system. It's that we are a consumer-based economy predominantly, meaning... When people are buying, that's when our businesses are thriving. Um, and everything ties into that uh, from a consumer perspective. When the consumer can no longer buy, everyone is impacted. And so what COVID did, and I think unfortunately, appropriately so, it shut things down. You always want to be able to live to fight another day. Right. And if people aren't healthy and they are dying and they are not living to live another day, businesses can't thrive. Right. So the shutdown, the slowdown, depending on where you are in the country, and that's the other interesting thing about this particular change in the cycle of business, um, state by state, it's very different. Country by country, it was very different. I mean, this world... Um, across the world, and it is still rolling across the world, and there is still um, the threat of the contagion um, continuing until there is a vaccine. And the interesting thing of thinking about the magic of the vaccine, yes, it will make us feel better, but what it really does is makes us confident about going back into the world the way we were before. So getting that consumer, getting individual confidence back up that we can step out and do things the way we used to do them, I think is what everybody's waiting for. But I think what this is a moment to be very thoughtful about what may not change. What might we have to live with longer and forever? The downside and the upside. I think one of the upsides we've learned in some businesses, not all of them, is that we don't need people in the office every day. Right. Um, sure. We can buy things online. Um, we can um, pace how we acquire goods and services over time as we are com comfortable and have confidence we can step back into everything from a hair salon to a nail salon. Um, to just sitting down and eating at restaurants. Those things are slowly coming back. Um, but we have figured to some extent how to get along in this current environment. And the question becomes, what are the opportunities in this current environment? Absolutely. We wanna take with us into the future. And what are the downsides of this current environment that we wanna be thoughtful and planful about for the future so that we don't get caught short again if we got caught short this time. Right. Um, every business was impacted by liquidity. Having enough cash, 
I don't care how large it was or how successful the business was, cash became king. It's always king and queen. Yeah. But in this environment, every business hunkered down, stepped back, looked at their balance sheet, looked at their bank accounts, looked at their lines of credit, looked at their debt to say, if I don't have any revenue coming in, there's no top line, I'm not gonna have a bottom line, but what do I need in terms of cash flow to stay afloat? And Absolutely. what do I need to stop doing in order to conserve cash? Um, that has become the driving um, force. And how do I do it in such a way that I don't devastate my employees? Because one, I need them. When there's a recovery, I need those employees back. And I can't, from day to day, month to month, companies have not been able to predict. And predicting is a lot about some, self -co some confidence down the road. But predicting how long this is gonna last, when they're gonna rebound. Um, one of my clients is in the medical device business. And their business was pretty much shut down because hospitals were consumed with COVID and they weren't doing any elective surgeries. Um, wow. So anticipating when COVID was going to get sort of under control, understanding it wasn't going to go away and we could start to ease back into elective surgeries became the big question mark. That is starting to happen. But the question is for every business, this is where I was pre-COVID, this is where I am today. Is it going to be a hockey stick or is it going to be this deep curve to get back to where I was or even close to where I was before? And I'm so glad you said something because I wanted your worldview from a corporate standpoint, as well as, you know, we serve a lot of small businesses and you put it plainly out there that every business suffer impacted from, from COVID-19. A lot of times we kind of compare the two you know, small business got shut out, big business is going to recover and they don't have as many challenges as small businesses. And so, but we did see some of the disparities in terms of how the distribution of the Paycheck Protection Program, the EIDL loan programs from the SBA and federal funds trickled down to some of the smaller and minority businesses and how difficult it was to maneuver through that process. And so as you can tell how, you know, we were receiving clients and trying to help them and trying to get them through the systems and the devastation of having to not know what was going to be next and how, if I can't get any funding, I'll never come back. Um, and so, you know, what was your intake on that in terms of how that, that whole process came about and, and what entrepreneurs are faced with in terms of that? So I think um, the process around um, uh, the CARES Act and the payroll protection, well-intended, um, strangely executed, uh, because no one had ever done this before. No one anticipated a worldwide pandemic in, it, in their worst case scenarios. Now, the possibility of it has been out there and written about but no one had put in place systems to actually deal with how are we gonna get cash to individuals, to families, to small businesses so they can stay afloat? And how quickly can we do this? So the fact that we got to it at all, and the banks, if you think about it, the banks had to respond to the government saying, okay, distribute this cash and we will guarantee these loans, but the bank, had to be on the hook for underwriting the loans to some extent right? Um, because they were on the hook as well and they were trying to figure out the rules of the game while the rules were being written or not written at all because people are written after <laughs> written after right. um, so i think it was the right action uh, i understand why it was so complex and difficult um to execute from the government and the bank's perspective, but I don't think anyone thinks it is enough um, in terms of saving small businesses, especially minority businesses, 
just like the unemployment rate is worse in minority communities, um, the potential for the business failure rate um, is greater in minority communities, primarily because of cash and liquidity and uh, being able to sustain yourself while you have no revenue coming in and you have no idea how long that's going to take. Um, so, yeah. and I was surprised, like we had some clients who were hesitant to even apply for some of this assistance yeah. because of their distrust or a couple of things I got. One, I don't trust the government. Two, um, I wasn't in a debt situation prior to this. I'm, I was in a good position. And do I put myself in further debt um, by going this route? And that was a major concern. Um, now you're seeing things open up as other alternatives because the devastation of the gap that didn't happen for a lot of minority business. If you're just logging on, um, the state of Ohio uh, recently released uh, some grant programs, but you have to be MBE certified or women owned EDGE certified to apply. And then the city of Columbus itself um, just recently rolled out another grant program. So now we're beginning to see after the devastation of what was left over, uh, of organizations are coming together, government, local, um, to try to provide some of that assistance to minority. What advice do you give to some of these business who are just hesitant about, you know, um, being in debt or what, what decisions to make at this time? So, you know, and it's hard for me to, um, you know, make a statement and have it apply to everyone. So everyone has to be thoughtful about this because you, you, you are dealing with uh, individual perceptions and concerns about debt and so forth. But if you're going to live to fight another day, right. you need to take the cash. And if you are apprehensive about it, um, find out as much as you can make sure you are in a structure, I mean, to, to receive the cash so that it is about your business. It is spent only on your business and the things that are designated uh, that it can be spent on. It requires a level of discipline, but don't be so afraid of it. You sort of cut your nose off to spite your face. Um, because if you are trying to live, to continue to grow um, another day, you have to have capital, but you have to have capital for the right reasons. Right. Um, it should be there, of course, for employees. It should be there, of course, I think, to cover maybe lease and rent payments because you're out of your office. If you don't have those types of expenses that the monies can be um, spent on, give it back. <laughs> don't right. spend it um, if, you, if you secured it. Um, but I think it's not uncommon for small businesses to be apprehensive about um, debt or, or equity investors even because of the sense of losing control or the sense of the pressure of having to pay someone back. I get it, but when you step into that world of being an entrepreneur, most successful entrepreneurs grow their business using other people's money, not just their money. That's right. Yep. So you got to get over that fear um, of, of being in debt. Um, it, well, in a situation where you have to borrow to sustain itself. And that's what I've seen. Um, it's funny because I, I, I went to a black restaurant last, last week. I think it was Friday. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm always, you know, in work mode, just asking, how are you doing? You know, what, what's some of the challenge are you having? And one of the things was talent. He said, you know, because of the unemployment, um, those are getting that extra $600 a week. Um, he had a hard time getting people to come back yeah. um, to work. And so I said, now, what does this say about um, the new normal in terms of how businesses are um, trying to sustain even talent? And it's weird because you have the highest unemployment rate right now yet you're having a difficulty retaining or keeping your employees to come back that you may be furloughed or, or let go at the time. And that is even a challenge. Um, so 
Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting dynamic. You know, that payment won't last long. And because of those implications, I doubt that it'll be extended. Some people may extend it, be, uh, the government may decide to extend it. But I think what it speaks to um, are the number of people that aren't making a living wage. There it is. <laughs> and therein lies the challenge. Um, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword because if you're a small business, paying a living wage is tough. If you're a large business, it's hard. You know, you've just recently seen maybe in the last year, larger companies raising the minimum wage above what, raising their wages, I'm sorry, above the minimum wage. Right. Um, if everyone had to, I'm just going to throw out a number, get to paying employees $15 or $15.75 an hour, um, some businesses could not survive under that. Um, or at least they wouldn't be able to hire full-time employees and they'd have a lot of part-time and then there would be implications on health care um, as well. So there's always this balance, um, but you're spot on. The $600 um, uh, subsidy is causing some people to stay home, but for others, even if they weren't getting that, they might try to stay home because they're afraid to work. COVID has impacted the African-American community at rates that are greater than our percentage in the community. And that's primarily my understanding. Um, and God bless us for Dr. Amy Acton. She has been a phenomenal champion of talking about the impacts of COVID because a lot of folks who look like us are African, you know, are African-American people of color and brown people are frontline workers whether that's in grocery stores, whether that's in healthcare scenarios, and frontline workers are um, exposed to people more and have a higher degree of risk of contracting COVID and being adversely affected by it for a myriad of different reasons, um, uh, all tied to disparities in healthcare. So you were appointed by the governor to kind of address this issue of the disparities uh, of health as it relates to COVID-19. Can you speak a little bit about what the goal of the committee um, is supposed to do and what, what, what do you see going forward in terms of outcomes from, from you guys organizing this effort? When you asked the um, group earlier, kind of what's the word that, uh kind of expresses how they feel right now. I'm going to say hopeful. I'm glad the governor and his team has asked, but this is not a new issue. We have had health disparities for as long as we've had um, social economic disparities, for as long as we've had issues of um, uh, policing, for as long as we've had issues around food scarcity. Um, this is not new. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic because the question is being asked, but um, words don't matter as much as actions. So it will be interesting to see what actions are actually taken and sustainable action. So that's where my head is now because what needs to be done isn't new, um, but it's important to sit down, revisit those things, get the input from leadership and frontline folks in the community as to what matters now and what will work. And so we will see what this administration does with this. Um, but I'm very, um, I'm very hopeful. I, I'm remaining optimistic. I appreciate that. Thank you. So when we're talking about um, health, emotional distress, Entrepreneurs typically have everybody come first before themselves. And I'm sure you notice know by owning your own business. Um, how do you uh, put it in perspective for some entrepreneurs who are really just, you know, emotionally, you know, um, connected to what's going on in this world? And, and I told you, I said earlier, our intentions were to talk about overcoming obstacles from, you know, COVID-19 situation. And then on top of what's going on with that, now we're dealing with, um, you know, the racial unrest of what's going on 
um, across this country. And it's added stress on top of what we were already experienced from a pandemic. And now, um, how do we stay focused? How do we keep pushing? How do we take this crisis to opportunity? What's next, Donna, for us in terms yeah. of handling this all at the same time? Yep. Um, two things come to mind. We don't have a choice. We have to figure out how to navigate these choppy waters. And as my friend Stephanie says, you know, we're all on the same choppy waters, but we're not in the same boats. We're That's all right. in different boats. And so we're experiencing these differently. But um, we have to, within our own locus of control, locus of community, do what we think makes sense. Don't ever let emotion and passion take you to a place of despair. Let it take you to a place of what can I do? And I don't care how small that thing is that you can do. Um, you don't have to rock the world, just rock your little boat. Um, that's right. Because sometimes we're trying to change it all and fix it all. Um, if you think about the protests, if there was only one person out there, no one would care or have said two words about it. It is the cacophony of voices. It's the color of the cacophony of voices that is making the difference today. Um, so one voice does matter. So figure out what it is you can do. And what you can't do, that's for somebody else to pick up and roll with or run with. Um, but don't underestimate the power of you, the power of your voice um, coming from a place of passionate, persistent, wanting to be positive, and you can be positive without tamping down the truth and right. your truth and your reality of what you deal with. The one of the things that I'm managing through are all the folks um, who want to talk. And talk is good. We do, I mean, that, that's a first step. You have to have someone to talk it through with. Um, and I have a lot of white colleagues <clears throat> who have reached out and they want to talk and it can be tiring, but I told another group, this is an opportunity for education, information exchange that we have needed for a long time. Now they are ready to listen. We need to be ready to talk and to share oh, right. and maybe they're ready to handle the truth and maybe not. Um, but you have to share your truth and you have to do it from a place of, I want to help you understand as much as you care to understand. Absolutely. At the end of the day, as black people, we have been dealing with these issues that have suddenly gotten on the radar of other folks for our entire lives. Right. And as soon as you're tired of talking about it, is when people are just beginning to listen. And they may not get it, um, but there, um, there is just this moment that we're in, as painful as it is, it's where growth happens. It's Our growth right. and the growth around us. Um, so just keep doing what we do as black folks. We know pain. For sure. <laughs> we pain. That's um, right our greater good that's why we are still here today um right. and so this is a time to name it and claim it um but do it within your locus of control don't feel like you've got to change the world you mm -hmm. just impact what's going on in your world and watch the ripple effect absolutely i like that someone says don't underestimate the power of you yeah. um you know, it's funny because I know last year we had talked about, uh, and I don't mind sharing, like last year I had a mini stroke. And as much as I want to be downtown on, on top of the courthouse and doing all, and yeah. I had to be mindful of my health and how emotionally I can keep that intact in terms of what I need to do. But one of the things that I've always dedicated my being in professionally is economic justice and fighting for minority businesses and things of that nature. Um, so when it comes to just staying in your world, we have disparities everywhere. You pick one, education, health, 
Absolutely. Economic justice, criminal justice system, whatever it is, or being able to identify what's important to you and how you can and take that. Do you think businesses have an obligation to get involved in the community? I think they're already involved. Um, anytime you're in service <clears throat> to someone other than yourself, you are involved. The question, is it passive involvement or um, is it proactive involvement? So obligation, responsibility, natural course of things um, in terms of being in business, you are involved. I think the important thing, at least for me right now, and there may be a translation for this for medium, small businesses and even startups, is what does that look like from your company? So what you have seen um, are larger companies, everybody's got a press release and a statement about right. where they stand. And that's great because silence is consent sometimes. If you don't talk about where you stand, I'm going to assume you're not standing with me. And what I love about the statements is that they're about standing on the side of justice or injustice. And it's as simple as that. And a lot of companies are saying we for justice. Words matter, but what you do matters more. So the next thing we're seeing is people putting dollars in different organizations, which I think so, is great. Um, but you can't buy or pay your way out of this. Are you putting them in the things that will drive change or into the things that will just keep seeding what's going on today? And, and here's what I mean by that. Um, and it's not a criticism. I just think it's a critical thought or thinking that we have to do in our communities and from a business perspective. If you believe that the societal contract has been broken, the civil society contract has been broken, and, and you can say it from the policing perspective as an example, or disparate impacts in health and, and, and economics, then we have created organizations and systems to support people who have been disparately impacted by that broken civil society contract. So whether it's the Urban League or the Center for Healthy Families, YWCA, we've got lots of organizations organized around, I'm calling plugging the holes, putting their fingers in the dam where the water was breaking so that people can live and, 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 and have wholesome lives. Do we want to put more money into plugging the holes in the dam or do we want to fix the dam? Right. <laughs> Do we want to change the course of the water, the trajectory of things? Um, and so we have to be mindful about the construct we have created to help one another and help people are, who are disadvantaged. Because if we're really serious about changing things and eliminating institutional racism, then we have to be thoughtful about if the money is going to do that, or is it going to continue to position us to help where the brakes are? Um, we need a reset. We need to reevaluate. We need to be on two tracks, in my opinion. Keep doing what we've been doing. That whole analogy of the babies have been thrown into the river and we're down at the end of the river trying to save the babies. Right. Or do you go back up the river now that we have this moment and figure out who's throwing these babies in the river and right. stop it at that point? This is easier said than done, but to unwind systemic racism is not a one check, not a one fix. And I can sit here and say that, but I have to more than say it. I have to help people understand what does that mean? Um, because it's my responsibility to understand it, not just the person that I'm chastising or talking about, you're just writing a check because those checks matter. What's the next step? What's the next evolution of this? And I don't have the answer, but I think that's in part the question we should be asking. Thank you for that. Cause I, I had some dialogue about that. I said, it's not enough to just write a check. 
but this time it's just not going to go away because you wrote a check. And so accountability is what the one word comes up for me is that, do you think that we're on the upward of just holding um, these constructs accountable for the things that have been going on for centuries? Yeah, I think we have a responsibility to define what we think the new normal needs to look like um, so that the folks who are writing the checks and saying, how can I help, can get directed to really where they can help. And so wh what needs to be done to eliminate health disparities? In some instances, it might be um, access to health care, um, but it may be access to competent, culturally competent health care. So what needs to happen with doctors and training? What needs to happen with um, healthcare systems and access to uh, the internet and broadband so that uh, we can access telehealth, um, which is right. you know not just coming, it's here. It's, it's here. Stepping back and looking at, okay, that's where the investment needs to go. Um, so it will be different because of the different systems that are in place to deliver services or the systems that have been placed that are broken where we don't feel fully accepted. Corporations have been working on diversity and inclusion for ever. Um, how do you actually get a workplace set up so that it is truly inclusive? It will not be a perfect fix. I, you know, you know, perfection is the enemy of progress. It's just got to get significantly better. And with each iteration, we learn what needs to be done next and keep it moving. Right. Um, that's how I, I look at it. Um, so I'm not expecting the person who's writing the check to tell me where it needs to go. I'm expecting myself to have an answer about where it needs to go, why it needs to go there, and some understanding in my own community about the, the importance of that redirection or that direction because we understand what we've been living through and we understand what needs to change. Some of us do better than others. Um, some of us are so accustomed to the system we have in place and figuring out how to navigate around it. Right. Yeah, it's like, I know how to navigate around it. Now I've got an opportunity to get the obstacle out of the way. What does that look like? For sure. So I'm enjoying the conversation, but I can't take up all the time with you. You know what I mean? So uh, we're going to open it up for some questions right now. Um, and if you have any questions for Donna, uh, please put in a chat, but, uh, chat box below <laughs> or aside or in the bottom. And then Janina, scroll up uh, some of those questions here shortly. Passionate, persistent, positive, powerful. As always, Donna is filled with such rich gems of wisdom. Yes, she does. Any questions that you have for Donna? Don't be shy. While we're waiting on questions, can I add something? Sure. One of the things I wanted to make sure I spent a little time on, or as much as you need, is kind of just as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a small business, medium-sized business, regardless of the size, what can you do in this moment that's very important, um, that you should do regularly anyway, but you need to do it now? And that is step back and take a hard look at your business. Absolutely. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different same. result, all right? Yes. If you are in a business and you are struggling, be clear about whether the struggle is up a hill and you can see the mountain or the struggle is up a hill of mud and you are not going to make progress because there is something that is misaligned. Um, you can be in business for self and it just be you. You can be in business for self and have 20, 30, or 1,000 employees, but there's still things you need to do to take a look at your business and do a reset. And I got reacquainted with the concept um, 
and I may be mispronouncing it, and it's called um, Ikigai or um, Aikigai. Okay. And it's a Japanese term, and it talks about um, the reason for being. But what I really love about this concept, if you can visualize this, there are four circles. And I think this applies personally, but it, it's also a recipe for stepping back and re-examining your business and where you are in your business. So it's the intersection of four concepts. One okay. is that which you love. The other is that which you are good at. The third is that which the world needs. And the fourth is that which you can be paid for. I'm, I'm writing this down. I'm, I wrote it down. <laughs> for our guests. <laughs> moment uh, for me. And there's an application for this for business, not just personal, because I may love something and I may be good at that thing I love and there may be people who need it. But if I can't figure out how to get paid for it, it will not sustain itself. I will not be able to sustain it. Right. And, and I used to tell people before, like, it's just a hobby. Right. You may love it. It's okay to have a hobby. And it's okay to have a hobby. Yep. But if you don't have any cash flow coming in, then you couldn't really, you know. So, so in this moment, maybe there was cash flow before COVID and it's not now. You have to be thoughtful about whether you can get paid for it in the future. And if you can get paid for it, doing it the same way you've done it before. The easy um, uh, example of that is e-commerce. Right, for sure. Um, do I need a storefront now? Um, do I need to have a studio where people come in and take this course? You know, so much has changed because of Zoom and other technologies. And these are not examples that apply to everyone's business, but you have to think about the business you're in that way. Then the other thing that I would say do is think about um, your core competencies, the things you are very, very good at in your business that maybe you were being paid for. What can that core competency be applied to in this new market or the way you think things are going to ch change because of COVID and you leverage those core competencies into a new or a, another business that's aligned with this one, right. meaning aligned in the sense that it relates to it, but it may not be exactly the same thing. Um, big company example that comes to mind is an organization that used to be in the food distribution business. Mm. And they were big on that. The margins on food distribution started to get tighter and tighter and it was hard for them to make money. They bifurcated into medical device and healthcare product distribution. Mm -hmm. That company is Cardinal Health. Yep. Fortune 50 company. I always remember that example because you, they took, the world was changing on them. Um, it didn't change on them overnight. They were watching this. And we always have to be on the watch for as the world is changing, but more importantly, as your customers are changing. Absolutely. All your customers, um, who are they? How are they procuring services today? Will they come back tomorrow? Um, and, and what will they need from you? How are you gonna differentiate yourself in order to serve them tomorrow. These are all things that we know in our core. It's now time to take those basics and reapply them and step back and re-examine to see where you need to reset. That's great, that's great. I mean, in a world of digitization, um, digitalization and, you know, you know, just understanding the trance that's gonna happen, there's, it's a new normal, we're not going back you know, and readjusting our businesses is important. Um, and I've seen, and I'm proud to have a few of our clients who just 
quickly just pivoted. Yeah. They didn't care what they did. They are now PPE owners and they, they're, they're providing uh, PPE equipment. They didn't have time to think about, this wasn't exactly what I do, you know? They just kind of stepped up the plate and say, hey, I'm gonna do this. And now they're able to provide a service that we need right now at that moment. Right. And so um, I've been able to see where there are certain people who just say, oh man, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do and just quit. And then you see other people thriving at this time just just going with the flow, taking it at the moment and say, oh, this is a great time for me to market my business. I'm going to do a YouTube channel. I'm going to do a podcast. I'm going to do, I'm going to put things online. And this is a great time to market why everybody is sitting at home. Yeah. <laughs> this is a way to, uh, you know, and just taking it, you know, just taking it head, head yeah. on. So um, let's entertain some questions. Janine, did you have anything? There are some questions. Miss Donna, you have a whole new fan base. And, <laughs> and that number, my gosh, I feel so inspired. Um, let's see here, a question, and I'm going to read it because it's lengthy. Okay. I simply love this content. Such a smart, lovely, and sophisticated woman. Job well done. You must hear that. Um, the question is, how important is a non-disclosure agreement when speaking with resources during the R&D phase of a startup? First question. Second, is it wise to obtain a trademark or a parent holding company for a corporation? So all good questions. Um, my answers are first, I'm not a lawyer, but let me give you my perspective on it. Um, and you can add it to what you've already heard. I have signed many non-disclosure agreements from entrepreneurs who have an idea of a concept and they want to protect it. And so um, an NDA, um, assuming that's what we mean by this non-disclosure agreement, is quite acceptable. Anyone who's not willing to sign it may not either understand it. Um, so be ready to explain it to them. Um, and if they get insulted by it, it's not your fault. Um, so yes, it's, and sometimes I will suggest to an entrepreneur that they provide me with a non-disclosure agreement because I just think it's a good tool for them to have in their toolkit um, anyway. Um, the other piece, um, a trademark for a parent um, holding company. For, um, I think it is, It's if you can afford it at that time, um, because you know, you never know if your rocket's going to take off and go to the moon or if it's just going to go right. next door, right? <laughs> right. And so if um, that trademark um, protects your business from others coming in and using your name and folks thinking they're buying from you and they're not, absolutely. But it is about what you can afford and when you can afford it as you are starting up. So, um, you know, I would put it on the list of things um, that you're thinking about um, and depending on your finances, you can decide um, how soon you go after that trademark. And I would say talk to a lawyer because sometimes you can be in business, you can be using the name and maybe not have a trademark, but you still have some, um, uh, how do I say this, legal hold on that name um, because you've been using it and for how long you've been using it. So this is one where you really want to talk to um, an attorney. Great. Fantastic. Another question we have is what can you say to black founders who are doing everything you're already saying, but not empowered in Columbus? Um, this is going to sound cute and trite, <laughs> but if they're not appreciating you at home, go somewhere else. Hey, go to another city, go to another community. And I'm not saying you physically, you can be based here, but you don't have to, all your clients don't have to be here. I have a number of friends who are entrepreneurs who could not get traction in Columbus. Could not get anybody to buy their wares for relationships. Who knows what the underlying reasons are? And I'm not sure if, if that is the, I'm um, touching on your definition of not feeling empowered. 
as soon as they started building relationships in other cities, they were able to sell their business, their uh, products. Then suddenly the folks at home started to appreciate them. And the hard part is not to be mad at them because they didn't get you the first time around. Right. You know, only amateurs stay mad and you're not an amateur. That's right. That's right. I said I was going to write this book. Why did it take millions for you to notice me? And that's that same exact, con that, that's the same concept. It's like sometimes we don't, um, you know, uh, we're skeptical of doing business with each other. And then if you go out and you do successful, then they say, oh, okay, now I want to call you. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, but again, I like how you said, don't be mad. It's just, it's just the way sometimes the nature of things, the way they yeah. happen um, to us. And um, I think it's, it's something to say about uh, geographic locations, the need for your product or your services and different areas, depending on what you're providing. Um, and what 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 people are accepting at that time in that geographic location. So it's not all about just, you know, it could just be what you what you have to offer is more needed in other parts of the country. So yep. that was good. Anybody else? Any other questions? I would just uh, kind of weave in a concept from one of our other executives on that same track which was this is the time to start working outside of your familiar network while we have access to Zoom and most people are at home, start thinking outside of the box and find those people that may not be typical or traditional or familiar partners to make sure that you're making them aware of the good that you do or your business or, or the service that you offer. Okay. Is there anyone? There's one more. Hi, Samuel. The comment here is empowered, uh, oh, clarification on empowered, empowered as an investment, grants, donations, or awareness in the Black community. Empowered as in, oh, investment, grants, donations, or awareness in the Black community. Oh, gee. Um, always tough, especially going after investors. I mean, this is sell, sell, sell yourself. Um, and you spend so much time doing that, you almost don't have time in the business, but right. that's what it takes. It's back to relationships. It, and, it's, and it's cultivating them and moving on if it's in a graceful way. If it's not a relationship that's productive, you thought it was gonna take you somewhere and it did not. Um, uh, that one is persistence through people and people relationships. Um, and I, advertising is not the right word for me uh, that I want to use. It's, it's a form of marketing, marketing self constantly, all the time, to ad nauseum. Uh, not to the point people run away from you when they see you coming, but... Um, right, right. Yeah. And you can imagine this difficult time as this of investors losing some of their oh, opportunities right now. And then, um, you know, what's going on with COVID-19, how they're going to go forward and what they invest in, you know, in terms of where do they are going to put their dollars if your business hasn't pivoted into anything new. It's going to be difficult at this time. There is a question about uh, what are the appropriate ways to maintain investors that want to become co-founders in order to land? Um, I mean, the original founders do not want to give up ownership and leverage of the company. I'm telling you. So this is where you begin with the end in mind. And I know you're already into it, but um, you guys have some uh, what I call uh, top shelf questions and top shelf problems um, to resolve. Um, you control your business. What you have to be able to do is separate your friendship relationships in these decisions from your business decision. Right. Because oftentimes I find these become difficult conversations when someone wants more out of it. They want their name on it, but you started it. It's your baby. How comfortable are you telling your friend or this person who's put money in may or may not be a friend that um, no, but, this is what I can do. Um, what you want to do is protect your ability to control the business. And this is where you always need, also need a good lawyer. You can have majority equity in a business, but not have control over it. 
Someone else can be controlling it. It's all, you can separate control from equity ownership. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say sit down with a lawyer and have them talk you through these different aspects because if the person wants more equity, um, the term, the title co-founder, I'm, I'm not even sure how they get there other than they want to pull their money out unless they're named co-founder. And that's where you have to identify other investors because if it's going that well, where the person really wants to be a co-founder or else they'll pull their money out, there's probably somebody else out there who will make um, that same investment in the business if it's that good. That's right. Everybody you start off with are the people you're going to end up with um, in your business. Great. Well, we are run, We have run out of time. We, it just was so good. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm always blessed when I get a chance to talk to her, but I know that she has probably 50 other things to do today, and I can't be selfish about it. Um, so we, we're, we're just going to, you know, take a break here and thank so much um, for your words of wisdom. I know that I have learned a lot and um, just listening to you and just getting the worldview of what's going on from all businesses. Um, and, and that's exactly what I want to accomplish today was to hear your view on what's going on holistically. And so we thank you and thank you all again. If you are um, online for the first time and you need any information or help or assistance with your small business or um, you want to talk about pivot strategies in your business, feel free to um, contact us, uh, email us at mvac at cul.org. Um, you can register with us at cul.org slash mbac and we can schedule you a virtual consultation um so we can protect ourselves and, and and did i say free it's free we will provide a free consultation so again thank you all so much for participating thank you donna as always um for your knowledge and your wisdom and your nuggets i'm gonna listen back to some of these things so i can write so now i can go back and take notes <laughs> myself um so uh good afternoon everyone enjoy the rest of your day